Luke chapter 24. And as you're turning in your Bibles to Luke chapter 4, just encourage your pastor this morning. Let me know when you find your way to Luke chapter 4. Hold, hold your Bible up. Whip out your phone. Grab a digital copy of God's Word. Open up Luke chapter 24. Let me know you're with me. Hold your Bible up high. Hold it up. Hold it up all around the room. I see you, church. All right, Luke chapter 24. I wonder if we have any uh, turkey hunters in the house this morning. Any, hey, anybody go turkey hunting this morning? Anybody? All right. Did you catch anything? Did you, hit, did you kill anything? Did you shoot? Did you shoot at one? We're not going to talk about it. All right. Hey, this is a place of grace and mercy and... You are accepted here, you know. Any turkey hunters? Any turkey hunters? How many, how many of you prefer deer hunting over turkey hunting? How many of you prefer turkey hunting over deer hunting? How many of you are like, man, it's duck altogether. It's something not, okay, I feel you, all right? I just want you to imagine yourself. I just want you to imagine yourself this morning. Guys, gals, teenagers, anybody that's ever thought about hunting. I want you to imagine yourself being on like your dream farm, the dream acreage, the dream place that you're going to go hunting. I mean, maybe you've already been there or maybe you're thinking when I retire or next year or maybe you're plotting, you're like you're planning the trip right now, you're planning who you're going with, you know, what guns you're taking, like you just, like it's the dream, the dream farm, you know you're going to be out there. I just want you to imagine you're there and it's the most beautiful day and you've got your spot. And it's the perfect spot, and it's exactly where you want to be. And about an hour in, here comes the perfect turkey or the biggest buck you've ever seen in your life. Can you just imagine it just for a moment? Can you just imagine that? And you've got it in scope, and it is like it's not too far. You, like you've hit this bullseye a hundred times. Like you know you've got it. You, like you're imagining right now what it's going to look like on, like on your wall. Like you're imagining right now what your friends are going to think. Like, you just, like you're just imagining bringing this thing home, right? Can you see it? And you've got it in your scopes, and it's there. And you go to pull the trigger, and there's no ammunition in the gun. And some of you guys are like, no, it won't happen. You don't understand. Like, we prepare, like, multiple days. You know, like, it, it will not happen. But can you just imagine how sick to your stomach you would be in that moment? Like, it's just, is it even, is it even hunting if you've got your guns but no ammunition? Like, is it, even, is it even hunting if you don't have the ammunition in the gun? Well, listen, there is no Christianity without the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. There is no church, there is no church family, there is no, there's no worship this morning, like there's no forgiveness of sins, there is no Christianity, it does not exist apart from the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. So the resurrection of Jesus has to capture our attention, the resurrection of Jesus has to be really important to us, the resurrection, like we must have a really clear, particular opinion about the resurrection of Jesus because guess what? Christianity, the global movement of Jesus, does not exist apart from the resurrection of Jesus. The resurrection of Jesus is the foundation of our faith. It's the epicenter of our faith. It is the everything of Christianity. And in Luke chapter 24, we get to see the ladies who heard of the resurrection and saw the empty tomb and had an encounter with the angels. We get to see them running to share the news. And we get to see how people respond to this. So look with me, Luke chapter 24, verse 1. And let's peer into the resurrection together. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Well, when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise? And they remembered his words. In returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna 
and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. Would you pray with me? Father, we pray that you would speak to us by your Spirit through your sacred scriptures, that you would speak personally to every one of us, that you would speak powerfully. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we see in this text that there are two responses to the ladies sharing this news about Jesus. There's two responses. And the first response we see is disbelief. That's the first response to the news about the resurrection of Jesus is disbelief. I want you to look back at it with me in verse 10 and 11. Look at this. Now, it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other woman with them who told these things to the apostles. Look at verse 11. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. This is a, this is a little bit of a tragic moment. The good news is, th is that the apostles would all eventually believe in Jesus. They, they would all like give their lives as a, as a martyr for Jesus, telling the story of Jesus, being a witness for Jesus. They would give their lives for Jesus. But when the news came about Jesus' resurrection, they thought it was like a tale. And they did not believe it. Now, why is this such a tragedy? It's because believing in Jesus is what anchors us into a relationship with God. It's belief. It's, it's receiving by faith the gift of eternal life through Jesus. This is the way John wrote it in the famous verses of John 3, 16 and following. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the Son of God. Isn't this amazing? The disciples, the ones that were around Jesus all the time, here comes the news, right? He had already told them. Do you remember a couple of weeks ago we looked at this text where Jesus was telling his disciples he would die and rise? And Luke says they did not grasp it. They, did not under they, didn't, gra they didn't understand it. And here they are, and the news comes. The glorious good news that Jesus is alive, that he's risen from the dead, that he conquered death and sin and the grave, and they did not believe it. And belief is actually what we need to receive eternal life. But what kind of belief is it? We must be careful because James tells us in James chapter 2, listen to this. He says, you believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe in shudder. So maybe you're here this morning, and you're like, oh yeah, I believe in God, I believe in God. Well, well the, the demons believe in God. So what kind of belief is John talking about when he says, if you believe in Jesus, you'll have eternal life? It's got to be a different kind of belief than James is talking about, right? Because James is like, oh yeah, the demons believe, and they're terrified. They believe that God is there, but they haven't put their personal faith in, in Jesus. If I told you this morning that I played for the Atlanta Braves, most of you would not believe me. You're like, nah, eh, just not buying it, you know, and I could rattle off stats, and I could tell you what the stadium looks like, you know, and like, I just go on and on. We could talk about the Braves all day long. And... But if you don't see me in a uniform, and if you don't see my name on the roster, and if you don't pull up the TV and watch the Braves game and see me in the game, then you're probably not going to believe what I say, Right? Listen, we can say all day long that we believe in Jesus, but it's our life being lived for him that evidences our belief. It's evidence of our faith. I can tell you all day long that I play for the Atlanta Braves, but if I don't have the uniform on, if I'm not in the game, and if I'm not on the roster, hello, I don't play for the Atlanta Braves. It doesn't matter what I say. It doesn't matter what I say. And so this morning you might say, oh, I believe in God. I believe in God. Well, the demons believe in God. It doesn't matter what we say. It matters. Have we anchored our personal faith, our hope, our dependence? Have we anchored our dependence in on Jesus? Have we, have we realized that we needed a Savior? 
and put our hope in Jesus to be a savior. It's interesting because the first response to the good news of the resurrection is disbelief, and belief is actually what we need. And that's what Peter had. I want you to look at verse, uh, verse 12 with me. Let's look at verse 10, 10 through 12 first. Now, it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But those words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. Look at verse 12. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen claws by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. And what does it mean to marvel? It means to be astonished. It means to be amazed. It means to be stunned. And every time we see in the scripture that people are marveling, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're putting their personal hope and faith and belief in Jesus, but I believe it does here. And I believe it does because look at verse 12 again. He says, but... Peter rose. In other words, the apostles didn't believe. That's what, that's what verse 11 says. The apostles did not believe, but Peter. So Luke is contrasting their disbelief with Peter's marveling, with Peter's astonishment. So I think it's a, a faith-filled astonishment. I believe it's a, a belief-filled astonishment. And here's the glory of Easter Sunday is that we get to come together and we get to marvel in Jesus together this morning. We get to marvel together, just like Peter did when he peers into the tomb. We get to peer in with eyes of faith. So let's first, let's marvel in the miracle. Let's marvel in the miracle. Jesus died. His heart stopped beating. His lungs stopped breathing. His brain stopped working. His pulse went away. Jesus died. They wrapped him up. They buried him in a tomb. Jesus died. They pierced his side. Blood and water pour out. He cries out, it is finished. And the scripture says, he breathed his last done life over. And they put him in a tomb. And he rose from the dead. Jesus came back to life. His heart started beating again. His lungs started breathing again. His brain started working again. Jesus rose from the dead. We marvel at the miracle of it all. It's just so amazing. He was dead in the tomb. It was over, and he came back to life. Hallelujah, a miracle. It's amazing. We just marvel, don't we? We just marvel at the fact that it was over, and God said, no way. I'm not done. I'm not done. And he raises Jesus from the dead. That's a powerful word for, for us this morning. Some of, you, some of you feel like you, maybe you felt like your life was done. God's not done with you. He's not done with us. It's not over. The re, as we marvel in the resurrection, as we marvel in the miracle, we realize that no matter how heavy whatever we're carrying is, it's not too heavy for God. Why? Death was not too difficult for him to overcome. The grave was not too difficult for him to overcome. And we marvel at the resurrection. Well, we marvel at the man, don't we? Jesus Christ, the, the author of Hebrews says he's upholding the universe by the word of his power. He is the beginning and the end. He is the image of the inv invisible God. That's who Jesus is. Jesus was born as a virgin. He grew in favor with, with God and man. His ministry was marked by power and compassion. He healed people and he taught with authority. He got up in the face of the of the religious leaders and he rebuked them and he reached out to those that were set aside and he reached out to them and loved them and showed compassion and value into, the, into those that had been discarded. Jesus, he's the bread of life. He's the fountain of living waters. He's the son of God. He's the unrivaled, incomparable God, Jesus. His ministry was marked with grace and truth. There's no one like Jesus Christ. And we marvel at this man. You know, before he went to the cross, he, he prayed and asked God. He said, God, if there's any other way, if there's any other way, take this cup from me. He knew the pain and the horror of what he was about to go through and bearing the wrath of God and going through the crucifixion. And he, and he asked the Father if there's any other way. But there was no other way because there was only one innocent Son of God that could pay for the sins of the world. And then the author of Hebrews says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Why did he do this? It's because he loves us. It's because he loves us. You know the Bible says that God is love? 
He loves us. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Can you imagine? Um, I walked onto the baseball team at UT Martin. Don't be impressed by that. I was just a scrappy guy, and we were in the bottom of the barrel in the OVC, right? So, I'd, like, I picked the worst team out there and thought, ah, maybe I can make the worst team, right? So, I made the worst team, and um, we, my, my second year in, we got a, a brand new Christian coach, in, uh, a Christian coach, and he would, he would close practice in prayer, which was really cool. And, uh, but he also had this other thing where he, like, when practice was over, he would not let us go unless we had all the, the same number of baseballs at the end of practice that we started practice with, okay? So at the end of every practice, we had to count all the baseballs. And if we were missing one, we had to go look for the one missing baseball, literally. Like, and so there was one day, we're missing a ball. He's like, go find the ball. And so we're all looking, and we're trying to remember who hit a home run over there and who overthrew a ball over here. And we're looking, and we, can't, we're, we cannot find the ball. So we come back. I'm like, Coach, we're just thinking, surely he's going to have mercy. You know, the, the sun's going down, and the... Um, and the cafeteria is about to close. So here we all, we're all on meal plan, right? So he knows, like, if we're going to eat, he's got to let us go. But we're trapped because we're missing a baseball. So we, like, come back, and we're just, like, looking, hoping, you know, he's going to have mercy on us. And nope, sends us back out. So we go looking again. And we look for another half hour. Sun's going down. Cafeteria's closed. We come back, and, and somebody asks, Coach, does it have to be the baseball we lost? And coach said, you just have to end practice with the same number of baseballs that you started with. Now, every baseball player in the building knows what a pearl is. A pearl is an untouched baseball. It comes like in a bag like this. Pearls are, like baseball guys love pearls. If you can find a pearl to warm up with, it's great. If you get to hit a pearl, that's pretty uh, enjoyable. But the thing about a pearl is like when you have a pearl, you don't want anybody messing with your pearl. And if somebody messes with your pearl, you get pretty perturbed. And, um, and somebody asks coach, the coach, does it have to be the baseball that we lost? And he's like, no, we just have to end practice with the same. Number. So our third baseman, Brad, had a pearl in his bag. And he takes out his pearl and he's just looking at it because he's like, I don't want to, he don't want to give up our, you know, but we're trapped. We're trapped. And he looks at it and he opens it up and he drops it in the bucket. And as soon as the pearl hits the bottom of the bucket, coach says, you're free. And we took off to the cafeteria. You know, I was like, oh, we can make it. We can make it. We get to eat. Jesus was the perfect, spotless, innocent, innocent, without a stain of sin on him. He was God's perfect pearl. And God looked down upon us and he saw us trapped in our sin and he knew we had no hope unless he made a sacrifice, unless he had a substitute that could stand in our place. And God, he didn't drop him, he sent him. He sent Jesus to this earth. And Jesus was a perfect pearl without sin. And Jesus went to the cross for us as our substitute. He took the wrath of God that we deserved so that we could get the grace of God. He took the judgment of God so that we could get the mercy of God. Jesus became a curse on the cross so that we could become the children of God. This is the good news of the gospel. But guess what? He rose from the dead. And when he rose from the dead, we know what he did on the cross was enough. What he did on the cross was sufficient. What he did on the cross, we know through the resurrection, satisfied the righteousness and justice and wrath of God. Jesus did it. Jesus did it. So the good news is you don't have to do it. Jesus did it for you. The good news is you don't have to earn it. Jesus earned it for you. The good news is you don't have to work so hard. Jesus did it all. So now we get to put our belief in him, put our faith in him, and live for him, not out of fear, but out of love and joy. This is the good news of the gospel, friends. He rose victoriously from the, from the grave. We marvel at the miracle, we marvel at the man, but let's marvel at the message. Because he rose, we can be forgiven. Because he rose, we can have a new identity. Because he rose, we can have a new eternity. Because he rose from the dead, we can have a new reality. We can have a new family, the family of God. We can be forgiven of our sin. Shame is gone and guilt is gone. And the Spirit of God is in us. We can have a new relationship with the God who made us because Jesus came out of the tomb. And friends, I just marvel at that reality. It just never gets old. I just can't believe he did it, and I can't believe it's true, but I do believe it because it's so, so good. It's so good. So I want to ask you this morning, um, have you heard the Lord say, though your sins be like scarlet, they shall be white as snow? Have you heard the Lord say, I'll remove your sins as far as the east is 
from the West. Have you heard the Spirit of God say to you, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus? Let me just ask you this. How have you responded to the resurrection? Some of you this morning, you came in in disbelief, but the Spirit of God has stirred something in your heart today. And you're like, you know what? I came in not believing, but somewhere during this hour, I'm believing. Maybe right now, right now, you need to see your need for a Savior and call upon Jesus and put your faith in Him. Put your disbelief aside and take on a heart that marvels in the miracle and in the man and in the message that you can be forgiven. Would you bow your heart in prayer with me? I just want to give you an opportunity to talk to God right where you are. I want to give you an opportunity in the quietness of this moment to ask the Lord Jesus to forgive you of your sins. If you're here this morning and you want to put your faith in Jesus, if you're here this morning and you realize he was your substitute and you believe this morning that he rose from the dead, would you, would you just say something silently but in your heart to God like this? God, I need you. Lord, I've sinned and I need a savior. I can't save myself. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus to die for me. And thank you for the victory over sin and death and the devil that Jesus conquered for me. Thank you. Lord, I believe. Lord, forgive me. Cleanse me. If you prayed that prayer for the first time this morning, just with every heart bowed, would you look up at me and raise your hand just so I can celebrate, celebrate with you? We had four people in the first service that said, I'm trusting in Jesus. I'm calling upon him to save me. Anybody here this morning, if you're worshiping with us online, this would be the time you just leave a comment and just say, I'm, I'm calling upon Jesus to save me. Would you just lift your hand and look up at me? Lift it high. Anybody in this place? Anybody in this place? join me in prayer. Father, we thank you for your amazing grace. And Father, some of us this morning were like the apostles and we're just not yet sure what we think about the resurrection of Jesus. And we pray, oh God, that you would stir faith. We pray, dear God, that you would birth faith in the hearts of men and women and boys and girls in this place. Father, we pray you would continue to speak throughout the morning, that you would continue to speak and that, Lord, that, that some in this place would get on their knees by their bedside tonight and they would cry out to you, Lord Jesus, that they would believe that Jesus is the Son of God, risen from the dead, crucified for their sins, alive at your right hand. Father, we thank you for your presence in this place. We thank you for your mercy and grace that is so strong. We thank you that together we get to marvel at this message that we're set free, that we are set free free from shame and free from guilt and free from judgment and freed into a relationship with you. So, Father, fill us with your spirit. Pour out your spirit upon us as we sing to you, O oh God. Strengthen everyone that's weak. Encourage the discouraged. Lord, convict those that have a foothold of sin in their life. Father, would you speak in this place and have your way in us. And all God's people said, amen. Let's take